This interview is for information only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy shares in the company featured. Welcome to this stock box interview. Joining us today is James Campbell, the MD of Botswana Diamonds. Hi, James. How are you doing? I'm very good, Mark. And how are you doing this morning? Yes, very good. Thank you, James. I've been keeping an eye on your activities. Lots of pictures coming from Twitter of you were in the field. So, uh, yeah, you're obviously very active. How are things over in, uh, in Africa? No, very good, Mark. And as you would know, during our, the COVID pandemic, we were able to maintain uh, some a high level of activity with, with corporate work and with field work. Uh, and now that we've, we've, we're almost past the COVID pandemic, some would say we're still in it, some would say we're not. Now, we have been able to kind of continue with our field work and, and continue with our corporate work, especially uh, in, in the light of the uh, increased r- rise in diamond prices. Indeed, indeed. Well, we're going to get a bit of a, a quarterly update. And of course, uh, your interims were released uh, only at the end of March, so just a few days ago. Let's start by looking at the diamond market, then prices rising upwards of 40%, uh, which is perhaps pretty significant. Absolutely, Mark. Well, uh, when we were in the COVID pandemic itself, diamond prices dropped by up to 30%. Uh, and there were many kind of doomsters who were saying, well, it'll never recover. My mother was a historian and she always says to me, James, history repeats itself over and over again. And and one of the things I did when I was at De Beers many years ago, we looked at diamond price trends over the last hundred years. And every time you had a black swan event, uh, call it a, a global financial crisis, a world war or something, diamond prices plummeted. But they always came back hard and fast afterwards. And, and that's exactly what's actually happened after the COVID pandemic. Diamond prices have come back hard and fast. Why? People want to celebrate uh, getting married, getting engaged, life events, being human, and what better way to do that with a diamond? Uh, so that has kind of, is the overall uh, reason behind the significant increase in price. And the other one is a structural one. Uh, because there isn't such a high level of diamond exploration going on in the world at the moment. Uh, And therefore, the older mines are getting deeper and more expensive. Fewer diamonds are are being produced. And and newer discoveries tend to be quite small, so don't really affect uh, the overall global supply demand equation. And then the other side, you have the rising middle class in in China, uh, in the Middle East and, and, and elsewhere, which is buying diamonds. So that leads to real diamond price growth. And that's compounded by coming out of the pandemic hard and fast. Mm -hmm. The report also mentioned about the the sanctions and uh, impact from supply from Al Rosa. Is that a Russian mine then? Is that right? Or... But that's correct, Mark. Uh, Al Rosa is the largest producer of diamonds in the world by carats. De Beers is the largest producer in the world by, by dollars. So they probably have, and it's quite difficult to say, about 20% of the world market. And, and we know uh, the majority of countries have very strong sanctions on Russia at the moment because of their invasion of Ukraine. Now, diamonds are a difficult one. Uh, in that they are very small, very, very easily transferable. And many of the diamonds get cut and polished in India and China, which don't have sanctions uh, against Russia at the moment. So those diamonds, I imagine, are continuing to be uh, cut and polished. Now, the key issue then becomes is does the US consumer really demand provenance over their product uh, rather than being price sensitive. Uh, And that's the debate the industry is actually having at the moment. Uh, And why is that important is that 25 percent or more of the world's diamonds are sold in America. So it's Mm. very Mm. significant. So if your average consumer, possibly your young person goes in and says, I want a Botswana diamond or I want a Canadian diamond, uh, then it will have an impact on uh, overall diamond supply and prices will go up. Whereas if a consumer goes in and says, I want uh, a one carat VVS and I want it as cheaply as possible, then provenance doesn't become such a big issue. 
Okay. 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 Good. So things looking uh, looking bright uh, for the diamond market. Then hopefully it's a very cheesy thing to say, but uh, but yeah. <laughs> Well, let's take a look at the projects then, James. So, um, Thorny River project. Um, you say that a mine development model will be completed uh, within a month, and you've also identified some some new targets as well. So, can you bring us up to speed on uh, on Thorny River? Mark, that absolutely. The two strands we're developing on Thorny River. One is the river and river extension blow, which we discovered uh, at the end of the year before last, and we've done extensive geophysical work, sampling work, and drilling work to identify these blows. And this is where we are doing mine planning. And as the interim said, we'll be publishing those results during the course of this month. Uh, the other strand is that during the COVID pandemic, we had a very, very hard look at all our historical data uh, going back uh, from before uh, when Botswana Diamonds was involved with Fotomi. And we found uh, far, four targets of which there were substantial geophysical anomalies, heavy mineral anomalies, or kimberlite, extensive kimberlite intersections, which had not been followed up. So we went back to those particular areas and we uh, did a very, very detailed ground geophysical survey. And four of them uh, gave very strong gravity lows, which is indicative uh, of a, a kimberlite blow. And the fifth one gave a uh, a strong linear gravity low, which is indicative of a kimberlite dike. So those four targets will be followed up in uh, the course of our dry season, which is your summer uh, and our winter. And the, the end uh, goal for this, or the objective, is to almost look at a hub and spoke mining model that will draw these out and maybe we'll have three, four, five, who knows, blows, uh, and then we can centrally locate a processing plant and have this kind of hope, hub and spoke mining model, uh, which is what we're driving towards at the moment. Okay, okay. And, and is Thorny River, it's not the existing mine. Is there an existing mine there nearby or not? Yes, Mark. Uh, at yeah. Six kilometres away west, there was the existing Marsfontein diamond mine, uh, which was mined uh, through a joint venture by De Beers uh, and Southern Era. Uh, and that mine was very small. It was only 0.6 of a hectare. So many people say to us, why are you interested in looking up at such small kimberlites? Well, Marsfontein was 0.6 of a hectare. It was mined for about 20 months. It produced over $200 million in free cash flow to the shareholders and, a three and a, had a three and a half day payback. So that's why we're looking for uh, these very small kimberlites. And as a result of this, we have to be very, very precise in what we are doing. So it's a different approach to exploration, which you would commonly have to many other areas in the world. Okay, okay. It, yes, it, it does sound very different because you, you're looking to develop a mine plan at the same time before you perhaps found, you know, how does it work with proving up a, a deposit for, a, for, for and developing a diamond mine? Well, normally it's the same kind of cycle that you'd have with, it, with any other mineral. You'll, you'll discover it, You'll then look at uh, the, the economic parameters, which for diamonds are size, volume, uh, grade, carats per 100 tonnes, and diamond value, dollars per carat. Uh, you would then look at the costing behind uh, a, a mine plan, uh, along with your processing plant, your infrastructure, and those kind of things, and essentially end up with a net present value. Mm -hmm. And for a junior like us, there are many different mining models that if you're a major, perhaps you would just automatically consider mining it to yourself. But what we've done elsewhere is we could joint venture it with somebody or we could even have what they call a royalty mining ar arrangement where someone else provides all the mining infrastructure and, and Botswana Diamonds takes a royalty. But that will all kind of flow through once we've actually completed our work. Okay, and, and do you go through the kind of feasibility studies that another that an, another commodity would go through, like PFS or DFS? Do you go through that similar process? We will, we will do on Gargu, absolutely in in Botswana. But whether we'll do it on, on this particular project because it's small, uh, a lot will depend on on whether we go the royalty mining route, the okay, uh, okay. The, the joint venture route, or our own route. And if we go our own route, we probably will go through. 
uh, the pre-feasibility study, feasibility study route. But if we have another form of commercial arrangement, we may not do that. Why? Because that takes time and costs a lot of money too as well. Okay. And if you think you found something good and small at Thorny River, maybe the payback in three days, similar to uh, Mars Fontaine, could, could, you could almost replicate that. So uh, you can just effectively get on straight away. Well, it, well in fact, uh, when De Beers uh, had a look at Mars Fontaine itself, uh, they and I, I was very much involved with the discovery of Mars Fontaine and the resource assessment at Mars Fontaine because it was so rich. Uh, many stages were actually skipped, uh, and those stages are there for a couple of reasons. One is to de-risk uh, your, your technical and financial parameters, as well as provide what they call a bankable study, so you can borrow money from a bank. But if you don't need to borrow money from a bank or don't want to borrow money from a bank, you can actually do many of these phases actually in parallel. Okay, excellent. Well, let's talk about Gargu then and uh, in Botswana. So you've actually extended what you call the long stop date of the 31st of March until uh, the 10th of May. So this is, how come you've had to do that? Is, there, is, it, is that a positive reason or, you know, just to give you more time to conduct negotiations? Mark, it's a very good question. Just before the end of the first long stop date, uh, which was the end of January of this year, uh, Vast Resources PLC uh, advised both Gem Diamonds and ourselves that they will be unable to fund the project. And, and they were our funding partners. Uh, we've got a special purposes vehicle called Aqua Diamonds PTY Limited. Uh, Vast had the uh, option to take up 90% of that. And we had the option of buying back in a further 30%. So they would have been 70% at the end. So uh, Jem then, I, I, I had advised Jem that we had been talking to a few other funders uh, and we started working with those in a more public manner on the 1st of February. But clearly uh, working with these kind of people over two months is, is insufficient time for them to do their uh, due diligence work, uh, et, et cetera, on it. So we came to, we're at a very advanced stage with a, a, a number of different funders. And, uh, and Jen were very generous to allow us uh, a further 40 days to actually conclude that funding arrangement uh, with potential funders. Okay, okay. So you're still confident that something can happen here? You can get the funding in place? Absolutely, Mark. You know, one of the uh, things I say to potential funders uh, is, are you interested in diamonds? And if, uh, many are not uh, because they're more interested in maybe battery metals or those kind of things. Well, if you are interested in diamonds, then I think it's almost automatic you'll be interested in Botswana. Uh, it's the premier mining destination in Africa uh, and one of the top mining destinations in the world. And, and if you look at the number of available Kimberlite projects, diamond projects in the world, and you add the resources of Gargu to our nearby KX36, we've got over 100 million tons of Kimberlite at indicated uh, classification. There are very, very few projects, if at all, anywhere around the world. So those people who are interested in diamonds would be interested in Botswana and would be interested in the project. But I go back to one of my earlier comments, Mark, is that uh, when I talked about the supply demand gap uh, and not much exploration going around, there are not many companies who are actively involved in the junior, uh, mid-tier and senior sector in the diamond industry at the moment. Okay, good, good, good. So let's have a look at the other projects then in, in Botswana. You've reached an agreement with the liquidators of BCL to acquire the remaining 51% of Miabwe, if I said that correctly. My Ibwe. Yeah, uh, this has been a project that has been kind of hanging for a long, long period of time. In, in fact, before uh, I joined Botswana Diamonds, which is five and a half years ago, uh, BCL uh, drilled out these kimberlites in the western part of the Central Kalahari Game Reserve. So it's very much part of our Kalahari strategy. And they recorded extraordinary micro diamond results uh, from one of the kimberlites. This was a done by BCL, which was the operator, is the operator of the mine uh, of, of these projects itself. But sadly, they are in liquidation. And that's got nothing to do uh, with their diamond projects. It's, it's all about their uh, Silibapiqui uh, nickel mine uh, in eastern Botswana. 
The liquidators have been working very hard. They found a, a, a buyer uh, for the Saliba Piqui uh, mine itself, and that's going through its particular process. Uh, and there's a mandate to dispense with some or all of the joint ventures. And clearly, when you have such a very high microdiamond count, this is something that's of great interest to Botswana Diamonds, uh, tactically, but also strategically, because it's in the Kalahari itself. And this, in fact, it was our, our third offer uh, we've made to the liquidators for uh, our share of the project itself, uh, which has been in principle accepted. Uh, uh, and now we're going along the, the kind of process in order to kind of release it. Okay, okay. So what does it mean tangibly for Botswana Diamonds then? What, what it basically means is we can unlock the lock jam because no work has basically been done on this project for many years. So okay. once uh, all the process has been complete, we can put together a fresh work program, which we're working on at the moment, and then we can implement it. So we can actually uh, get on with the process uh, of exploration on the Maiwi Kimberlites. Okay, perfect, perfect. And then the other project, the uh, Dimestrat, uh, again, did I say that correctly? Uh, work is that was fine, good. The work is continuing there, and you've also found evidence of the presence of undiscovered kimberlites as well. That, that's correct. If, if I go back momentarily uh, through the COVID pandemic, one of the deals we did was the acquisition of uh, Petra Diamonds' assets in Botswana itself. And that consisted of three parts, the KX36 discovery, which I mentioned a moment ago, uh, and that has a processing plant attached to it, but also the second largest diamond database in Botswana. Uh, obviously, the largest is, is De Beers's. And uh, we then, uh, a, a short period of time later, at the beginning of last year, we then uh, had an arrangement with Dime Extrat uh, Botswana, which is a private diamond exploration company, Botswana, backed by Australian linked uh, Burgundy Diamond Mining Company to actually look at our data, put that together with our historical data, their historical data to see what other Kimberlites we could possibly find in Botswana. And, and you can imagine this is a very, very large uh, data exercise using all the kind of modern quantitative uh, thinking, big machine data, all that kind of stuff. And yes, we've had some very encouraging results that have come uh, through it at the moment, uh, and we hope for new discoveries there too as well. Okay, good, good, good. So there's three projects, um, possibly starting uh, on the fourth as well, so quite a lot of exploration going on. Could you give us a bit of a snapshot of the financials? The report mentioned the, the capital raise of uh, £550,000 last October. How well are you funded for the activities going on this year? And yeah, just if you can give us a bit of a snapshot of uh, of, of the financials and um, the cash burn situation. Our cash burn market, if you have a look at our interims and if you go back for uh, the past four or five years, is anything between £350,000 and three quarters of a million pounds per annum. Uh, and that is all in. If we're not doing a huge amount of work, uh, it'll tend towards the £350,000 mark. Uh, if we are doing a large amount of work, which we are funding ourselves, for example, when we funded the, the bulk sampling on, on Thorny River, it'll go towards three quarters of a million. One of the things that we pride ourselves in Botswana Diamonds is to really minimise uh, our uh, not-in-the-ground expenditure. So that's uh, salaries, fees, compliance costs, all those kind of necessary things to keep a company going, uh, but not necessarily uh, adding a large amount of value to shareholders. So if you look at the kind of cash burn going forward, I've already mentioned that we plan to do the drilling uh, in your summer and our winter, which will be about June, July. That will be an, a cost, but it's not very expensive here in South Africa. There will uh, be further work on, on Maibui. I've mentioned about the, the fresh uh, work program that we're actually undertaking there. And those are the two main exploration costs. So our, our typical uh, cash burn would probably be around uh, four to 600,000 pounds a year with that level of, of, of drilling and uh, activity. Okay, okay. So to sort of sum up then, you've got um, some further drilling at Thorny River and the development of a bit of a, a mine plan. At Damastrat, you're also going to be doing some more uh, drilling on these undiscovered kimberlites. And then uh, we've got uh, 
Miabwe, which is uh, an ongoing, uh, uh, hopefully all that gets sorted out and you can then get some work programs active. And then Gem Diamond, um, again, negotiations ongoing, but hopefully sorted within a couple of months. Is that to sum up really what's going on? An excellent summary, Mark. I can't fault it. Okay, good, good, good. So just a final question, James. When we, I'm sure we'll catch up in the interim as and when news comes out. But let's say next quarter, or maybe let's go a bit further, maybe go to like quarter three. What kind of things would you like to have seen achieved by the company by, by the end of, let's say, quarter three, or end of, you know, end of the, uh, the drilling season, let's say? Very, very good question, Mark. What I'd like to see if I look at Thorny River first, because that's what we kind of uh, started our press uh, interim's press release with, I'd like to see the, the, the drilling having converted two or three of the, the four targets to blows uh, to, to then add those onto the mine plan that we're developing for the river and river extension blow. So then we have a model for a hub and spoke mining plan for Thorny River. That's my objective there. For, for Gagu, uh, I hope we've concluded the funding and we are well on our way to updating the, the bankable feasibility study uh, for the project itself, which will in turn lead to uh, a rapid uh, development going into production within a year. That's certainly what we actually uh, anticipate. And then with our Diamex Strat and, and Myibri projects, our other two projects, we've generated work programs and uh, we've drilled further into Kimberlite on one or both of those two projects. Okay, excellent. Well, James Campbell, the MD of Botswana Diamonds, thank you very much for giving us that update of this quarter. And I believe it's Geologist Day, so I know that uh, you are a geologist at heart. So happy Geologist Day to you, and uh, we'll catch up again in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much indeed for having me, Mark. Much appreciated. If you enjoyed this interview, then give us a thumbs up, a like or a retweet. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter and hit that notification bell to be the first to know when we release new content. There's loads of great content on our website too, across all our programs at stockboxmedia.com. Thank you for watching.